Why hello there, welcome back to my channel. Great to have you here with me once again. If it's your first time, nice to meet you. Hope you're doing fine regardless. Hope you're doing fine regardless. God damn, man, I look really dark in this light. I'm not sure if the light or if it's my actual skin tone, but either way, I'm looking a little bit toasty. So, interesting development, you know, in the whole Chris Delira affair, which has sort of come to a grinding halt. The allegations so far haven't really been, you know, corroborated to any sort of great extent. The only sort of repercussions Chris Delira has basically, it felt, have been from the industry. He's essentially been iced out from his community. He's been basically abandoned by most of his close friends in comedy. The Netflix movie that he was meant to do, he got replaced in. The Netflix show he had with Brian Callen got scrapped. So, by and large, it's been a pretty crappy year for Chris Delira professionally. But I guess personally things are going pretty well for Chris Delia. you know he's back at home being a dad right being a good fiance and all that malarkey so things could be okay but it has been an update courtesy of Whitney Cummins who appeared on the Tim Dillon show podcast special bonus episode on their Patreon I will definitely encourage you to sign up to Tim Dillon's Patreon he must have one of the best patrons out there maybe second only to come town but definitely up there one of the best comedy podcasts on Patreon hands down definitely worth value for money five dollars I think per month it is it's definitely worth your money definitely go and sign up there and like i mentioned in previous videos i'm not necessarily the biggest fan of whitney Cummins on podcasts anymore she can be a little bit too much to listen to over a short period of time she's similar to kind of to burt in that way you have to take her in small doses but i thought tim Dillon and whitney had a really good chemistry they sort of bounce off each other really well some great topics were spoken about had some a couple of good laugh out loud moments and generally a pretty you know middle of the road podcast but towards the end tim Dillon decided to drop a bit of a hammer blow and decided to ask whitney the question that all podcast fans especially fans of the LA comedy scene have been wondering this entire time how could Whitney Cummins throw Chris Aaliyah under the bus considering how long they've been friends right they worked together on that show Whitney that she helped to write or produce I think the entire thing that was running for a long time he even played her boyfriend on that TV show so he basically he appeared on every single episode they didn't continue their professional relationship in comedy the random times I did see Chris Aaliyah on the Whitney Cummings podcast she made it known that she really loved him she appreciated him they had a very close working and professional and personal relationship and then of course the allegations about Chris Aaliyah came out and I just found it very strange that Whitney Cummings being a friend would want to be the first person to come out and basically admonish him without actually hearing his side of the story now of course I have no proof whether or not she did reach out to Chris Aaliyah privately but I guess from what she did publicly in terms of deleting all the images of Chris Aaliyah on her Instagram feed deleting the episodes of Chris Aaliyah on her podcast feed and also just generally the statement that she put out pretty hastily after the allegations surfaced kind of made me lead to believe that most likely similar to the, how the t-fat k-boys were crying on the podcast they were you know eager to get out there and basically distance themselves from Chris Aaliyah publicly but they weren't eager to go out and reach out to him personally or privately behind the scenes to hear what he has to say and you would imagine if that was you in that position you would want your friends to stick by you especially if you really adamantly believe that you did nothing wrong now we have no idea what actually happened we weren't there in the rooms we were not present um we weren't in a group text or we weren't even in a text chain where he was going on with some of these alleged young girls but from what we can ascertain he might have been a bit of a creep now would we go as far as saying that he was a pedo i wouldn't go that far but does he have a tendency and maybe so far it's alleged that he has maybe a preference for girls that border on the young side of things yes is that a bad thing probably not especially if they're legal or unfortunately ethically or morally is that a bit yucky of course it is but of course but again like i mentioned we have no idea what exactly happened because we weren't there and you would imagine if those are your friends they should be the ones that should be giving you the benefit of the doubt us as just a view in public we can write him off if we want we can label him any name that we want to label him but if you're his friend you would imagine you would owe somebody a little bit of a courtesy just to kind of be like hey did you do this thing that they're saying that you did did you do that thing that they're saying you did just so you can hear their side of the story and make your own mind up from there by and large i have to be completely honest i kind of ascribe to the eric weinstein mode of thinking when it comes to dealing with your friends and you know public uh, backlash and stuff i'm of the thinking if your friends get in any sort of drama outside of like something very heinous right like you know murder or something you don't need to make any public statements zero keep your mouth shut you don't need to get involved at all i don't see this need to publicly run out and distance yourself from your friends it doesn't make you look good it doesn't increase your opportunity of getting jobs it doesn't do anything as apart from just illustrating or signaling to the audience that you don't care too much about your friends you care more about your own career you would you would hope that friendship would be a little bit more higher in lists of priorities when it comes to these people as opposed to the actual career you would hope so but anyway let's play a bit of the clip of whitney Cummings had to say about chris Aaliyah, and i'll come on the other side with my commentary 
country. As a final question, because we have done an hour, okay. would you have Chris D'Elia on your show? I've talked I, I've talked to a lot of people because about we it. we can't leave the Patreon without that question being asked to Whitney Cummings. But wait, I... <sighs> Whitney Cummings. Why didn't you open with that? People I, have already tuned out. No, yeah, that's true, but we'll, <laughs> we'll clip it. Okay, you have them put it up front. I absolutely would. Um, absolutely. Do you feel that your friendship has suffered? <laughs> <laughs> if him coming on my podcast gives me a bump, I, we're even. <laughs> can they truly be even though? Can they truly be even? And can Whitney Cummings or is she even in a position to say I would have Chris on my podcast? If I'm Chris Elia and I genuinely think that I didn't do what I've been accused of and I did nothing wrong, you know, no DSP, I did everything correct, I did nothing wrong, then why the hell would I want to go speak to Whitney Cummings? One of my closest friends in the industry decided to go out of her way to publicly distance herself from me because of an allegation that she wasn't willing to even have a private conversation with me about. Why would I go on your show? Why don't I don't talk to you in the first place? Really strange, isn't it? Um, I want Louis to come on. Um, I, would, I would love to have... I think that there's a little bit of... You know what it is? It's more... My what problem with having a podcast is I'm too afraid to ask people to do the podcast because I don't want to be that person that's like becomes jury duty to someone what? with asking a podcast. Uh, so I don't ask a lot of my friends, but I would absolutely have Chris on. I'd absolutely have Louie on. I'd have fucking anyone on. If R. Kelly, call me from jail. That's a mad sentence. If you're R. Kelly, <laughs> so she's basically grouped Chris D'Elia in the same company as Louis C.K. and R. Kelly. And you could argue that Chris D'Elia and Louis C.K., don't deserve to be in the same sentence as flipping R. Kelly. What would happen if I did? What would happen if I had Chris D'Elia on the podcast? I don't know. There is a, yeah. I, I, I think people would like to see people sit that down. conversation between you and him. I think so, too. I think people would like to see that conversation. This is not going to be funny, but I would like to see, uh, if we're not going to do it, who the fuck is going to do it? Like, a, a world where we can go, I don't agree with what you fucking did. I've, you know, I have addiction in my life. Like, I, I, I can talk to you about this and not, like, right. th thumbs up what you did. And the thing is with that, no matter what I say or what I ask or how we talk about it, they're going to say, I, I wasn't hard enough. I didn't come hard enough. I'm like, well, I think this is someone that's struggling with an addiction. And why beat someone when they're, they're suffering? This is a suffering person. But what are you talking about? This Is this woman clinically insane? No one's going to say you weren't hard enough from Chris Lee. People are going to be questioning why Chris Lee is even sitting down talking to you in the first place. Because you're the one that threw him under the bus. You're one of his closest friends. And instead of reaching out to him privately to to find out exactly what happened you went up to social media and put out a flipping garbage statement you remember the statement that she put out when Crystal Lear actually got accused of what she got accused of let me put up on the screen it's taken me a couple of days to process the information I've learned about Chris I'm devastated and enraged by what I've learned this is the pattern of predatory behavior this abuse of power is enabled by silence now that I'm aware I won't be silent girls should be able to be a fan of a comedian they admire without becoming a sexual target it's the adult responsibility to be an adult now the reason why this is full of hypocrisy is I believe my own belief again this is me personally i don't know anything i don't know these guys i don't know what's going on behind the scenes i'm over here in the uk i have no extra knowledge it's my belief that most people within that little la comedy scene had an idea of what chris was getting up to not ex the extent of it not that oh he was maybe going after people that were really on the cusp of underage but in terms of him being a bit of a ladies man and doing just about anything in his power to make sure that wherever he goes that he had certain girls lined up they all knew because they would all make jokes about it on podcasts. I listen to too many of them. It's their own fault. They record themselves speaking for hours and hours and hours on these podcasts. They share details that they probably shouldn't be sharing with the public. And it was my impression for the longest time that Chris was a bit of a ladies man. I didn't know it went as deep as the allegations are. You're basically alleging it went as deep as. I'm still not too sure whether or not they go as far as they're basically insinuating that he was a kiddie fiddler. I don't think it goes that far. But in terms of him being, you know appearing at the comedy store with with a with a bevy of young girls and being the only comedian in that comedy store who maybe has a gaggle of girls that are under the age of 25 they all knew so if you did know and now you're coming out with a statement acting as if like oh my god i had no idea this is all a big shock to me for your friend who you were okay with when it was happening because you know it was kind of a funny stick to beat him with he was sort of like oh he's the handsome comedian he's the goofy one and then as soon as it kind of works against you and it might hamper your deals it might stop you from getting certain production things and being able to direct this and that whatever it may be now suddenly it's like oh i had no idea i had no idea i'm so shocked girls should be able to be fans like get out of here get out of here we're allowed to do it in drama remember when um 
fucking Lindy West had sat down with Jim Norton and he was making the point, why can't I make rape jokes but CSI every episode is a fucking raping a hooker? Right. It's okay if it's drama. Right. You can do an eight minute anal rape scene if right. it's drama, the Gaspar Noe movie about? with right. Monica Lebulucci. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. that you can do, that's fu- that gets awards. But as right. soon as I joke about it, I'm fucking, uh, you know. So to me, it's like, why is it that like as soon as R. Kelly goes in jail, everyone's fighting for the first interview. Gail King's talking to R. Kelly. It's like we're putting them on the morning show, but we can't on podcasts talk to people in a much more dimensional way. I- you can talk to every again. What's she talking about? I don't know why she's lumping in Chris Delia with R. Kelly. It's, that's insane. First of all, I wouldn't want to go on your show when you're mentioning my name with that guy in the first place. Cool. Secondly, you can have whoever you want on your show. You're not having them on the show because you're going to lose sponsors. So you're choosing your sponsors over your friend, which is fine. But let's not kind of conflate the things. Let's not kind of, you know, let's not try and fool the public. We know why you're not having them on the show. We know why Joe Rogan doesn't have Brian Callen and Crystal Lee on his show either. Why he doesn't mention them on his show is fine. It's okay. But let's not pretend as if like, you know, oh, the society won't let me do what I want to do. It's a podcast. You upload it onto YouTube and you've got a, a podcast feed. You have sponsors that, you know, pay you a pretty penny for you for to be able to get in front of your audience. It's okay not to want to lose your sponsors over some serious allegations your friend is kind of dealing with at the moment. You shouldn't be in a position where you are sacrificing your own financial future because of your friend. Okay. But let's not lie about it. That's all I'm saying. Just don't lie. I don't know. I, I think it might kill me. I mean, I think my life might be over if I do it. But Garbage I don't know. I don't think so. I think Garbage it would be an interesting friend. conversation. Yeah, it'd be a very interesting conversation. I think I'd be scared. He'd probably, you know, we talked. We were we we've talked about we were gonna um, get together uh, before the holiday, and then Sounds you like know, a lie. COVID happened, and I don't know. There's got to be some kind of ability to talk about this kind of stuff. If for nothing else, is because it's fucking interesting. We're comics. Like why people? Like, you can't do that, dude. You'll be over. It's like. We can't have interesting conversations like that, you know. I don't know. You tell me. Well, I mean, I don't know him that well, and I don't know how he would react, but I feel like, you know, you guys were tight, and that would be a conversation that would be entertaining Mm -hmm. to watch. And Um, that's, I'm getting more so than like him coming on my show, which he could do. But like I, you know, you're a woman. You knew him. It's yeah. More, there's more meat there. Because I'm trying to figure out my, my. I don't know what he did. My whole thing. With that's Chris the is other like, thing. I don't know what he did. Here's the other I've, thing. Listen. Yeah. I feel like just before she got interrupted, she was gonna say something like, "I'm trying to figure out my position in this, my role. Why are people so bothered about what I think and what I do?" And I don't know. It felt like she was gonna say that. And if that is the case, you know why? You gave the impression that you guys. Were, that's the thing as well about these people. It's so annoying. Like maybe it's a. I don't think it's an oddly parasocial thing. I don't think it is on my on my side of things. But I guess because I don't have many close friends of my own, I kind of do things on by myself. I'm a bit of a lone wolf in that regard purposely and sometimes maybe because people don't want to be my friend who knows right it is one of those things but i'm too old to change that's not going to happen so i'm not going to suddenly be the guy with a massive social group but in some cases i'm kind of that you know that meme where there's that kid that's like sitting down and there's like a billboard and he's like acting as if the people sitting on the billboard are like his friends and he's eating cereal with them that's kind of like how i treat podcasts you're kind of you because i don't have my own close friends i'm sort of like my friendships are sort of i'm living my friendship dream through those guys right so when they give you the impression that they're all good friends and that you know they kind of you know sit around the table and construct bits or come up with premises and you know um touch up jokes with each other and just you know bust balls and go on holiday and hang out have dinner we got whatever right this kind of illusion that they give you whenever the first point of like struggle or backlash comes and they all kind of scatter and run away from each other and you know don't kind of back each other up the same way that they were previously when on each other's podcasts it cool it leaves a sour taste in the mouth it just does yeah if i had a little sister i wouldn't be like hey let's go to a show but i don't know and i said i was very uncomfortable with people having everything taken away over a text message and it was to me i need to see more evidence here's exactly. what i'm gonna but say that's across the board Hotter take i believe we have always uh, known that comedians are not savory, morally upstanding people, Correct. and we've never yeah, given true. a shit. So if Richard Pryor 
you know, said I beat my wife and set himself on a fire with a crack pipe today. I, we knew all that about him and we kept going to say, you know, yeah. I feel like comedians, you know, all of a sudden having to be these like, you, you know, uh, uh, morally upstanding yeah, heroes. Paragons like, what is this new thing? All we've ever done is go on stage and say we're scumbags. And then you, right. we're scumbags and you're like, what? It's right. like, so to me, comedians being held to the standard, you know, is is just this new thing that is, is, is hurting fans of comedy because like, if 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 mental if mentally ill people that make really bad decisions that have addictions can't be comedians anymore, <laughs> comedy is gonna suck. It's like my thing with Scott Rudin, like he, you know, he's the biggest Broadway producer in the world. He's an ab super abusive boss, makes the best fucking Broadway on the planet. You guys want to cancel him? Broadway's gonna suck for a while. You know, a lot of these people that have uh, make really bad decisions in their personal life are great at what they do, or that's what it took to right. be that, They're you know what I'm saying? Up. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying like, you know, I think that comedians have to be the people that go like, I know you did horrible things. I don't condone that, but let's, we can still have a conversation. I've done horrible things, you know, like I went on my, I, I said on my podcast that I was like, dude, I'm just going to say this now. I fucking dressed up in kabuki makeup when I was 21 for Halloween. I went as a geisha and like, there's photos somewhere. I was 21 years old. Like, I'm just going to fucking start saying the shit because if that comes out, right. people are like, how could you do that? Like, what do you mean? I was a 21-year-old right. moron. Right. So I just think that there's this, um, that comedians have never pr promised. We're not doing to rappers. We're not doing to football players. We're not doing it to musicians or rock stars or Mick Jagger or any of these people. It's like specifically the people that have already advertised that they're mentally ill. She's copying mad, please. Don't really believe most of the things she's talking about, but it is what it is. And to put into context, why this is so disappointing to me do you remember when the all harvey weinstein allegations were coming out right they were sort of slowly but surely trickling out to the media this is before rowan farrow put out his book that i read that's really good that sort of details the entire allegations and how they basically come to light and how eventually harvey weinstein was brought to justice do you remember when that happened quentin tarantino who was maybe one of harvey weinstein's closest friends in the industry came out when those allegations were red hot, right? I think when at the time there might have been a, about 36 women or so had come out, individual women come out and basically alleged Harvey Weinstein had done something lewd and abusive and to them in the industry in some way, shape or form, right? 36 individual women came out and alleged some untoward business with Harvey Weinstein. And this is what Quentin Tarantino had to say. Remember, 36 women. Remember, this is 36 individual women came out and said these very heinous things against Harvey Weinstein. Some with varying levels of proof, but most of them with detailed stories regarding their very unfortunate and somewhat traumatic experiences with Harvey Weinstein in Hollywood. And Quentin Tarantino had this to say. Again, Red hot times. This is when the allegations are red hot. He can, you know, kick the guy while he's down, distance himself from him, and no one would really bat an eyelid. But Quinn Tarantino said the following. For the last week, I've been stunned and heartbroken about the revelations that have come to light about my friend for 25 years, Harvey Weinstein. I need a few more days to process my pain, emotions, anger, memory, and then I will speak publicly about it. So if Quentin Tarantino can say that about Harvey Weinstein, why can't some of these LA comedian donuts have a molecule, have a little bit, an iota of self-respect and a backbone and whatever you'd call it, loyalty to their friend and stick by Chris Alia, at least for the first two weeks the allegations came out, if more evidence came out that made you think, you know what, I can't do this anymore, then cool. But they came out straight away and distanced themselves from him. You had Brian Cannon and Brendan Schaub crying on the flipping podcast. I can't, I can't talk, I can't talk nonsense. You had Whitney Cummins putting out that statement and now she has the gall to go and Tim Dillon and say, yeah, I would have him on my podcast. Oh, thank you. How kind of you. After you eviscerated me in public and distanced yourself and basically added to the pylon and the council culture, now you are welcoming and willing to have a conversation with me on your podcast whilst in the same sentence putting me in the same company as a monster such as r kelly come on man come on but again maybe i'm reading too much into it and maybe again like i said because of my lack of friendships i've kind of put too much weight into these podcast people's friendships and it look like a bit of a donut who knows let me know in the comments am i reading too much into it is whitney cummins within her right to basically be like you know what i know more than you behind the scenes so i'm going to publicly distance herself from him should chris Ali have a bit of a grudge against her let me know what you think in the comments down below i'd love to know your thoughts and opinions peace